Well, we can't hear it. Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Power Woman Worldwide Power Women TV. This is Eve Hernandez, and I'm going to have to put these on. Welcome, by the way. If you're joining us for the very first time, please make sure to say hello, join StreamYard so that we can actually um, ask your questions to our guest speaker and also see your comments below. If this is your first time, and for those of you who are regular, thank you for coming back. And we appreciate you marking your calendar and setting your alarms for 5 p.m. ET every Thursday right here on our Power Women Facebook group. My name is Evie Hernandez. And I am a strategic growth speaker at biznversity.com. And I'm also proud to say that I am a member of the Power Women Elite. And most recently received the certification as a certified virtual presenter. If you would like to be a certified virtual presenter, please make sure to visit Power Women and also, you can leave a message below and one of us will check it if you'd like to join this prestigious community. I want to say hello to Laura Timbrook. Hi, Laura, one of our past guests. Thank you, Laura, for being a regular on our show. And now, with no further delays, I want to introduce you to our powerful woman guest tonight. And that is the wonderful and beautiful Sandy Weaver for the Center for Workplace, Workplace Happiness. Welcome. Thank you, Evie. How are you doing today? I am doing good. I am doing good. Thank you for that sweet introduction. I had my hair done today just for today's session. Oh, Actually, well, I did it. And you're <laughs> awesome. I absolutely love your hair. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. It, COVID turned it gray. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Actually, COVID turned it silver. I'd been coloring my hair for a many, many, many years and I liked being a redhead. And then I just, you know, COVID came and the salons were closed and my hair grows really fast. And I looked at the roots and thought, I wonder what I would look like with silver hair. So I decided to find out. I figured, you know, you hate it, you just dye it back. But I well, like it, it. Looks, it looks good on you. And I hear you because I'm in the same situation. You can tell more today that I have a ponytail. But I said, you know what? I'm just going natural today. So yep. everybody can see my loose weight chin. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. beautiful. So, thank you. So I am so happy. I was hoping that you were going to bring one of your doggies. But <laughs> let's talk about your business because I know that there are some doggies in your business who are probably your partners or your sidekicks. So for those of us that don't know your full story, why don't you share that with us, please? Okay. I am the founder and program director at Center for Workplace Happiness. And at the Center for Workplace Happiness, we work mostly with veterinarians and their teams. Most people don't know this, but veterinarians are some of the, and, and their veterinary technicians too, some of the most stressed people in the population. And just because of who they are, they are really caring people. They want to take care of everybody else. They're perfectionists. They want to be able to handle everything on their own and think they should be able to handle everything on their own. They don't take care of themselves. And I'm a workplace well-being expert um, certified through the AVMA, which is the American Veterinary Medical Association. And I work with hospitals and their teams to either create a well-being program in the hospital if they don't already have one or to help them improve what they already have. And with COVID, a lot of people don't think of veterinarians as frontline workers, but they are. And veterinary teams are really, really stressed right now. I mean, it's, this is a rough time. 
On one hand, they get to work in their hospital without the distraction of the owners of the animals because most veterinary hospitals are doing what's called curbside medicine. The, the people come up and drop off their pets or they sit in the parking lot and the pet gets taken in, taken care of and brought back out. That's in a way easier for vets and their teams than a communication standpoint, it makes it much harder. So they're facing lots of extra stress and extra challenges right now in trying to keep themselves healthy so that they can keep their pets healthy. And I'm just there to help out. Wow, I already learned so much. First of all, I, for whatever reason, I don't know, but I never thought, you know, in my previous life, I was a pharmaceutical rep. So I used to go to doctors and they didn't take care of themselves. And right. of course, a veterinarian is a doctor. And it never occurred to me that it, there would be so many similarities. That is amazing work that you do. Wow. Thank you. It is the, the suicide rate among veterinarians is exceptionally high. Uh, between 2.1 and three and a half times higher than the, norm, the regular population, the regular non-veterinary population. It's, it's massively high. So the work is needed and the work is really gratifying because if I can just help one person with one coping skill to get them through one more day, that's all it takes. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about that so we have a better understanding, kind of get us into the mind of where they are and how you help them. And before you do that, I want to make sure that I remind uh, everyone that if you do have a question, and I saw one of our regular viewers, Barbara Barron, joining Hi, Barbara. us. Thank you, Barbara. And if you have any questions for our distinguished guest here. Um, please post it there and I'll make sure to get it to Sandy. Thank you so much. And yes, Sandy, if you can please kind of help us understand the mindset and how exactly you go in there and help them. Let me tell you who they are first. Veterinarians, yes. most veterinarians wanted to be a veterinarian from the time they were preteen to early teens. And so from that point on, when they were looking at it, maybe with the school guidance counselor, they realized that veterinary schools are harder to get into than medical schools and as expensive as medical schools and harder to get into because there aren't as many of them. So if you want to be a veterinarian, your grades not only have to be top notch, you have to focus and do like pre-vet school classes during summer break when you're in high school or work at veterinary hospitals or, or volunteer at shelters. You have to be really focused and they are focused and they are driven. They tend to be really great students, um, straight A students. And the straight A students tend to be more introverted because they're not focused on their social life. They're focused on their, their business life. They're focused on where they're going in the world. They're focused on their one big goal, which is to get into vet school. Then they get into vet school, maybe sometimes on the second or third try, and they want to do it because they love animals and they want to work with animals and they want to help animals. And they come out of vet school with exceptionally high student loans and a desire to help animals and a desire to work with animals. And they get to their first job at a veterinary hospital and they realize veterinary hospitals are really staff heavy. And so they're not working with animals as much as they're working with people. And their ability to help those animals is impacted by how compliant the owner of the animal is. And an awful, I mean, we're not compliant where it comes to taking our own medication. So think about how good you would be at giving your dog or your cat particularly cats because they're so hard to pill, a pill four or five times a day to help them get better. Pet owners are not as compliant as humans are with our own medications and humans aren't very compliant with our own medications. So the person who is paying the bills, the person who is helping the veterinarian pay all that staff and deal with all that staff and pay down their student loans is the same person who is standing between the veterinarian and their ability to take care of that pet that came in. So, and, and they're, they're not a people person to start with. Most of them are not. Some have really exceptionally good people skills, but most just smile and grit their teeth and get frustrated and they take that frustration home and they don't deal with it because they don't know how. And so what I do is I work with them in just some really basic, I call it happiness. Um, my, the program that I do the most is happiness is job one. And I, I make it fit whatever the issues are in 
in a veterinary hospital, many of them have really similar issues. Some of them have very singular issues. Occasionally you'll, you'll go into one where there's a bully on the staff and a bully on the staff is really difficult. And it becomes even more difficult when the bully is the best technician. Oh, and wow. Yeah, and that happens. And so in, you know, in a situation like that, we have to kind of move things around a little bit. But I customize the work that I do with the veterinary teams. And it's really fun, it's interactive. I also am, uh, because suicide is such a big problem, not just with veterinarians, but also in veterinary technicians, it even equates to the front desk help and the kennel help. They are slightly high, more likely to complete a suicide than the average population, not as extreme as the veterinarians are, but they're still, even they are slightly more higher to complete, or com more likely to complete a suicide than the average population. So I'm also a certified QPR uh, suicide prevention instructor. And so I teach staffs exactly what to look for when you're looking at somebody who's stressed and they're really stressed and you're looking for the signs that maybe they're getting overly stressed and they're thinking about taking a really extreme solution. I teach people what not only what to look for, because sometimes seeing the signs is actually pretty easy, but it's knowing what to do. And basically, I teach them exactly how to let the care that they have in their heart come out of their mouth. And I give them the tools that are that are local for them so that they know who to call, what to do, do I take this person somewhere, what do I do, how do I handle it, what if I say the wrong thing, what if I put the idea of suicide in their head, oh, here's a clue, you never will. Because if you think they're thinking about suicide, they're thinking about suicide, you didn't make that up. So yeah, it's it, it's a bunch of different ways to work with them and some of it is has was virtual before uh, COVID hit and now a lot more of it is. Like you, I'm a certified virtual presenter. Thank you um, to, for to the Power Women presentation skills um, platform there where you can go in and just become certified. So got certified there, got certified through eSpeaker. So dual certified virtual presenter. Yay. Yay. Awesome. It, does. it makes you feel so much more confident and comfortable because you know that there's a, a high mark that you're getting over. So that's good. Wow. I have a question from Laura Timbrook. Okay. She wants to know, is there a reason why the staff is so high risk? Because it's this, it's a level, it's kind of an insidious level of stress that never gets dealt with. So when, let's just say it's the veterinarian who is the, the lead veterinarian at the hospital. Let's just say that veterinarian is very, very stressed and doesn't deal with it personally. It's going to leak out in the way they handle people around them. And it's going to just be, you know how you can have that feeling that something's just off and maybe you loved going to work yesterday and you loved going to work the day before that, but today you're, it's been off for so long. You just kind of dread going to work, but yet you still have to go to work and you still have to make money and you still love animals and you still want to help and you love your coworkers and it's just a little stress. So the stress level just builds. And if you don't, if it doesn't get managed, it causes a lot of problems. It causes a lot of personnel injuries, which is very bad in uh, veterinary hospitals. As you can imagine, there are lots of ways to get hurt there, not the least of which is having a client or having a patient not like you very much. Um, so you end up with more injuries, you end up with more turnover, you end up with people calling out sick all the time. Um, it, it, when you start seeing a pattern of those things happening at a hospital, you know that what you really have is a well-being issue. Wow, that is amazing. And our fearless leader, Pegeen, asks, does euthanasia play a role? I will tell you that there are very few veterinary suicide attempts. Very few veterinary suicide attempts. I don't know that this was the exact question that Pagin was answer, asking. So there's there are two potential questions here and I'll answer them both. So I'll start with the first one. There are very few veterinary suicide attempts. They know how to use a lethal dose of euthanasia solution and they know how to do it right the first time because they do it all the time. And so, yes, the other piece is what you feed your brain constantly is what your brain comes to believe. Whether it's true or not, what your brain hears you say all the time, your brain believes is the gospel truth. 
And so veterinarians on average count and vet techs counsel their clients on average two times a week have a conversation that sounds a lot like, you know, Fluffy is getting on in years. And if you're thinking about making that decision, I have to tell you, euthanasia is a gift that you can give them. It ends their pain and it ends their suffering. It's a hard thing to do, but sometimes you just get to the point where it is the right thing to do and it ends their pain and suffering and your dog or your cat or your hamster will tell you when they're ready to go. They have that conversation and they hear that euthanasia ends pain and it ends suffering. They internalize that message. So when they are in suicidal desperation, when they are just right at the end of what they think they can manage and they just don't see a light at the end of any tunnel, they hear those words in their head and they believe those words in their head because they've said them so often. So yeah, wow. euthanasia, that- on both ends of it, euthanasia has has a lot to do with it. Well, thank you for answering that. And really it makes us as pet owners, I I am, a, a, I own, I have a little baby bunny. Well, she's going on four years. And uh, now, you know, it's it puts us as perspective as owners, how we behave in cases of emergency. Because as you were saying that I recall, I used to have a different pet I used to have a dog and it was a pit bull and it got ran over but it still made it and I remember that I was in so much stress and I was like I've never had actual kids so that was my only child and when you were saying that story I said my imagine that and how much I put on those poor people. Now I'm like feeling bad. I'm like thinking I was like horrible. I was a horrible mom because I was screaming. I did not want to get out of the room. I did not want to leave. I mean, I was such an overreactor. We're talking about 20 years ago, but I just, you made me think about that. And now I'm going to be like thinking about that, you know, because I had never thought about it. So thank you for raising our awareness as pet owners, how much of that we can do to really control them and talking about how maybe we as consumers can help them. Barbara Barron is asking, are there any red flags that you notice in terms of suicide red flags in these vet offices? Yes, and it's with everybody. The, The red flags aren't just with veterinarians, the red flags are with anybody who is in suicidal, some people call it suicidal ideation. Some people call it just suicidal desperation because that is where they are. They are desperate and they don't see an answer or an end to their pain except for taking matters into their own hands. But red flags tend to, and this is this is just me being really off the cuff um, because you have to put everything into context, but red flags tend to be giving away things that they value or telling you that um, they can't make plans with you in a, two weeks from now because they just don't really know where they're going to be. Um, and if they, you know, obviously that's a very innocuous comment if the person has been happy and go, you know, light and doing all the normal things. But if they're out of their normal pattern and they say something like that, then you have to let your ears perk up and take notice. Giving, giving away important things, not making plans in the future, saying I just don't, th- I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, I think I'm a burden to the world and I'm a burden to the people that love me. And I just, I, I just don't need to be a burden to them anymore. I need to, I need to just, their life would be better without me or your life would be better without me. There, it's pretty obvious when somebody is really stressed and they're saying things like that, take them seriously because here's the really good news. 98% of the time, all you have to do is have a willing listening ear and 98% of the time you're going to keep them from going any further than just saying those words to you. All you have to do wow. is let the air that's in your heart come out of your mouth. About 2% of the time there is enough brain, organic brain dysfunction that you can't get through and nobody could. So please, if you know somebody who has completed a suicide and Um, I actually know two people. And in both of those cases, they were in the 2%. They were not in the 98%. Um, They had some organic functional issues going on in their brains and there just was no way to make a difference in their lives. Wow, Sandy. Well, thank you for giving us that education of things we can do in general, all of us. Um, Number one, look for that. And number two, be a little mindful 
of you know those front workers and yes i hadn't thought of them as front workers yeah. now let's let's turn this around you know in the remaining time that we have together um because we can talk about this more and it's very deep let's turn this around a little bit and talk about you are a certified virtual presenter and your business you've had to kind of reposition the way you said you started saying that you were doing mostly virtual so why don't you tell us about your business your business model how is is it doing now and how is it how are you running your business effectively and profitably right now it's uh, it's been an interesting time i think that in the future when people look back on the covid era or whatever they decide to call it they're going to see it as a time when businesses either adapted or they died and mine is in the serious adapted stage um, I'm in the middle of adapting so let me not say that it's been adapted it's being it's adapting I actually, I, I do, I'm a dog show judge too. So dog shows kind of went the way of the dodo during COVID because it's a public gathering. It's people have to get close together. The judge clearly has to get close to the dog and close to the dog's handler. So both of my lines of revenue depended on being able to get in groups of people. And so it's been interesting. What I have done was I decided I'm going to take my Center for Workplace Happiness, which is the name of my business, but it's never had a web presence separate from my speaker page. It has never had a web presence of its own. It now has a web presence of its own. It's under construction, so it's not ready for prime time, but it does have its own web presence. And I'm putting up and pushing out on-demand training. And that is going, excuse me, I, I got some stuff in the mail today. That is going so well that I got my first... Kajabi hero. We yeah, yeah. that's my very first hero. I posted a silly picture in the Kajabi page. Let me see if I can replicate it. You're a champ. What do you think? Is this um a little too subtle? So just telling everybody I'm a hero. So basically Kajabi is a platform and I think one of the dumbest business decisions that I ever made in my whole life, one of the dumbest business decisions was when I first saw Kajabi. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I saw it the first time probably four years ago, maybe five. I'm not sure how long they've been around, but I didn't get the power of Kajabi. And then in May, Pegin did one of those, here's what we do. Um, here's what I'm doing. Here's why I love it. Here, let me just show you mine. And so she showed me hers and I looked at it and I am so proud of myself. Because earlier this year, when I decided I was going to put courses online, I did some research, the web guy that I use, we did our due diligence. I have a WordPress website and he found the best plugin for it. And about $2,500 and two months later, I still couldn't sell a course off that site because it still wasn't working properly. And about that time, Pegin did uh, a session online where she just invited us to come and see what Kajabi looked like on the backside and how you built things in Kajabi. So I'm typically one of those people that says, well, now I've paid good money for this and I'm going to make it work, dang it. And I looked at what she had and I looked at what Kajabi had to offer. And I said, oh, oh, colorful language. No, this is, <laughs> this is where I'm going. And so um, I, I took the 28 day challenge. And within the first month, I hit my first milestone. Within the first month, I made more than what Kajabi cost me for the first year of the Congratulations. Class. You know, you are a Shiro, you know, so, Kajabi calls us. I'm, I'm also a Shiro in Kajabi. Yeah. And for those of you that are wondering what it is, we have a Kajabi sisterhood that is part of Pegin's Power Women uh, worldwide. And actually, the meeting for the Kajabi sisterhood will be um, around 6.30, if I'm correct, correct, correct. Um, Pegin, yeah, yeah 6.30. So uh, if you are asking yourself, what is Kajabi? Do I need to move in Kajabi? Please feel free to reach out to Pegin or post a question below and Pegin and, or one of us will get back to you. But yeah, it's it's powerful. So you know, congratulations because you are truly a Shiro. You did it really fast and you're like like rolling. I mean, you're like amazing. Well, thank you. And what I was really excited about was I took a personal victory, which was realizing when I was wrong and being willing to, no matter how much money I'd poured into it, change horses mid-race. 
um, I, that's a personal victory and it turned into a financial victory. And I'm just so excited. I couldn't be more excited about it. It's, it's awesome. So, fulfilling. so and fulfilling. You know, that's one of the perks of elite. And that's what I want to get yeah. into before we finish tonight. I know that you were one of the first or among the first power women elite. Yep. Please can you share with us your experience in Power Women Elite and what it has meant to your business? Yes, connection, accountability, the ability to think and plan my business bigger than I ever, ever was willing to look at it before. I first, Pegeen came across my radar the first time. Um, I think I met her at Influence, which is an NSA for those who aren't NSA, uh, NSA's annual conference. I met her at Influence and was so in awe of her. And then up comes Power Women of NSA on Facebook and I joined that group and I was still so in awe of her. And then I ran into her at a personal development workshop that was in the Atlanta area where I live. She had flown up and was so in awe of her. And then she rolled out this, this private mastermind group and that was 2016. And I lurked for the first bit because I was so in awe of her and so in awe of some of the other women there. I just, I felt this big in, by comparison. And I have just grown as a businesswoman and grown in confidence. And I attribute that completely to working with Peggy, completely. Because during those years, I have winnowed out of the other women's groups that I was in. I was in some other really good women's networking groups, and I have slowly just let them go because I don't need them. The most powerful group of women, the most loving group of women, the most giving group of women, and the most non-intimidating group of women that I know is the Power Women Elite group. And I'm just so pleased that I made that decision and stuck with it. Yes, yes, I know how you feel because I feel the same way. So congratulations, Barbara Barron is saying congratulations. Laura Tim Barbara's Brooks. one, Laura's yeah, one. Laura says Sandy is the queen of niching. And then we do have two questions, one from Romy. Thank you, Romy, for joining Romy's us. Romy's one. And she's asking, what are you using Kajabi for? Selling a new course, paid webinar, ebook. And then Barbara wants to know if your course is live or pre-recorded or a hybrid. So maybe if you can kind of go through all those. <laughs> so far, it's just courses. And it also is two masterminds. I've started one mastermind um, that I will start promoting. But so far, nothing live from there. But this is just me still learning the ropes. I'm, I'm intending on doing a webinar. And I just don't know exactly when that's going to happen. But um, so far, it's it's pre-recorded. It's exactly the way Kajabi models it. It's you know set it up. Here's a here's a video. Here's a video. Here's a video. Here's some handouts. Here's your next steps. And boom, you're done. <laughs> it just makes it really easy to do. And the the cool thing about getting the certification as a virtual presenter and having my lights and the microphone and the backdrop is I can stand up here on the second floor of my home and create courses plug them into Kajabi and be being paid by this evening. So it's- I love that. And yeah. here's a wonderful quote. Thank you, Barbara. She says, Sandy, your success is super inspirational. I'm so happy to have met you in Power Women Elite. Thank that you. Is, that's what you are. You are truly inspirational. And so is yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So before we finish tonight, um, is there anything else that you would like to say? And I do want to remind those of you who are not part of the Power Women Elite that you can join Power Women Elite by going to powerwomenelite.com. There you would find information about the certification as well. Also, feel free to just ask right under the comments and, and Pegeen and, and the team at Power Women Worldwide. Someone will get back to you. And uh, like I mentioned, if you are interested in knowing just what is Kajabi about, also feel free to reach out to Pegeen or Power Women Worldwide. Or just if you're here right now, just post us a question and we'll monitor that. So, Sandy, do you want to say a few things? Yes. Thank you. If you have a pet, please be kind to your veterinarian and their staff. Please, please understand they are under a lot of stress. If you want to take them flowers, if you want to take them cookies, if you want to send them something fun, if you just want to send them a fabulous thank you note for the work that they've done with your pet, you will not believe how much 
one little gesture from you will mean in their lives. So please do that. I love that. I find that that is like a public service announcement that we could all do. I know that you have really educated me on this and, you know, thank God that I really haven't had to really take um, Princess Bubby, that's her name, or Princess no. Bubby. <laughs> um, I haven't had to take her except for her nails, but now I know how to do her nails. So I do her nails, but um, really it brought things into perspective to me to be more aware. And that is something that Sandy has actually taught all of us today. If you're a pet owner, to be mindful that we can contribute to the health and well-being of them and not contributing to their overall stress. So sandyjweaver.com is the website. Sandy is, of course, here in our Power Women. Feel free to follow Sandy, to reach out to her if you know uh, uh, your your veterinarian, um, if you perceive that they're in need, reach out to Sandy. Perhaps that could be something that Sandy for sure can help them. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Please mark your calendar and plan to be with us at 5 p.m. I also want to remind those of you once again that the Kajabi Sisterhood is here at 630 and also, last but not least, the Kajabi Sisterhood, awesome. Uh, if you want to join me live today, I'm doing another Facebook Live inside the Biznaversity page of Facebook. And today we have a Power Woman Elite that we're going to be interviewing, talking about how do you connect online now that we can no longer attend networking events and that is one of our previous guest speakers here at the power women tv that is shauna kabotsnik and that'll be at 7 p.m today by visiting facebook.com biz university right here on facebook live i want to say thank you to barbara Barron. she is always here to laura to romy and to all our wonderful power women everywhere. And of course, thank you to our powerful, awesome leader, Pegin, who allows us to help each other and grow with each other. So thank you for Pegin for doing this. And of course, Sandy, thank you for being our guest here today. Thanks, Evie.